Brother, you ought to, I ought to recognize the fact that we, uh, that you sent me to New York to the New York Convention this last summer. Uh, you know, that, that convention was really an inspiration. Uh, there was a lot of good received from that convention, both uh, professionally and socially. And uh, it seems though that the professional part of it, we'll probably tell you now and then, uh, referred to one person uh, who they called Brother Moses, uh, the engineer of New York City Planning Commission. Uh, it was really a wonderful fellow. I wish I could uh, use the adjectives that he used. Then the social angle of it, uh, I'd like to pass on to you people, especially to you gentlemen. You know, uh, have you had the opportunity to go to a convention and uh, be pulled from five different angles and afraid to do, uh, to accommodate one without offending the others? Well, that's what happened to me this summer. We had five ladies uh, there at the convention and they're all, uh, they all had their ideas what to do, what they want to do, and what meetings to attend, and, and, and they wanted to make sure I was welcome to go with them to all their meetings. And you know, I had a hard time picking out the meetings that I wanted to go to without offending one of some of the others. But anyway, we survived and we did have a good time. We had a wonderful convention up there and a lot of inspiration. And uh, professionally speaking, I hope that more of you people will see fit to join the National Education Association sometime soon. Also up there was another gentleman who uh, uh, to me appeared to be sort of an FBI affair. Uh, he, he was making a speech one day and gathering all the remnants together of, a, of an investigation case. and. Uh, he put it together, it did sound like one of these uh, Senate investiga investigation committees. But I'm sure it wasn't that, it was all in fun. And uh, he has had a lot of experience in Washington and uh, at conventions. He is uh, not only our own executive secretary of the Indiana State Teachers Association, but he is also the president of the National Executive Secretaries or such a uh, title, I don't know exactly what the title is anymore. They, they get bigger titles to go along, I guess. But anyway, he's president of the National uh, uh, Executive Secretary Association, which is the department of the National Education Association. And uh, uh, he is uh, becoming nationally known in his efforts in professional leadership. And we are indeed happy to have with us today uh, Mr. Robert White, who I told uh, some while back that he could uh, talk on anything that he wanted to talk about, and that this was a social hour, and that he should entertain us if he wanted to, or he could give us a lot of good uh, heavy meat or whatever he wanted to do. So uh, I left the field wide open. I don't know what he's, he's uh, going to talk about, but I do know from a remark or two I heard here a while back that he feels that the uh, problems of our schools are many and the responsibility of the Indiana State Teachers Association is a grave one in connection with those problems. So at this time I'm happy to present to you people uh, Mr. Robert White, our own Executive Secretary. Robert. Thank you, Roger my fellow teachers and your distinguished uh, guests. I'm glad to come back to Muncie again. <coughs> Been only two days since I was here, but it's nice to get back anyway. Came over Mrs. Wyatt and I two days ago, day before yesterday, to deposit a baby boy on Jack Emmons' doorstep. <coughs> We hope Jack takes good care of him and makes a school teacher out of him. <laughs> We're trying to do our part to alleviate the teacher shortage. <laughs> I told him when they left him the day before yesterday that, that uh, practically everybody over here knew who he was by now, and I certainly knew his mother and knew me, and I said, for heaven's sake, be careful now. <laughs> I know some psychologists would say that I am impinging upon his psychological health or something of the kind by putting such a thing into the poor boy's mind. 
But I would reply to that by simply saying, you don't know George. <laughs> That boy loves life, <laughs> and he loves boys and girls, especially <laughs> girls. <laughs> We're happy to have him over here, and I hope he makes it. <laughs> I'm to keep my fingers crossed. It's been two days, I hadn't heard from President Emmons about anything yet, but I presume that uh, Jack did know that I was coming over today and <coughs> he'd see me so he didn't need to wire about anything. <coughs> well, I appreciate the nice things that Roger said about me. I was sort of nonplussed there for a while as to why he was going on at such a rate about those fine people that he took to those conventions. <coughs> It finally did dawn upon me that the point he was trying to make was that they were nice ladies. <laughs> I don't know whether he's had any trouble about it or not. <laughs> he was trying to head off trouble, he says. Well, you know, Roger and I know more about each other than we tell. You know, Roger Greenwald and I were born and raised only five miles apart. Of course, Roger was quite a bit older than I am. <laughs> but we grew up up there in Noble County, both of us, just five miles apart. Roger, when he was coming along as a young man, I had great pride in him. And uh, <clears throat> as he grew up, he... It was said very generally there in the community that he was a self-made man. Well, all I've got to say about it is if that's true, it certainly relieves the Almighty of an awful responsibility. <laughs> Roger and I are sort of like the preacher that was going through the country preaching at various places as long as he couldn't as long as he could prevent the one place from hearing about the previous place that he had preached <clears throat> and uh, one uh, evening he was uh, warming up to his uh, sermon and into the back of the church came two pretty rough looking characters that he had met in a in a previous town <clears throat> And uh, as he looked at him, he was just in the process of reading the text. And he said, uh, he had given the text, uh, and then as he saw these two rough characters come in, that I think they had been playing with some, some little cubes or something in the previous village. <coughs> he said, well, uh, on second thought, the text today will be changed from uh, the second Matthew, uh, the sixth verse to uh, the tenth chapter of John, uh, the fourteenth verse, which reads as follows <coughs> Verily, verily, I say unto you, if you see me and know me, lay low and I'll see you later. <laughs> fine superintendent of schools, Mr. Schaefer, who is giving the city of Muncie a fine uh, administration and fine leadership. And also with your friends from the lay groups, particularly the people here who aspire to be members of the legislature. Mm -hmm. I noticed that several of you have been in the legislature before, and I believe several have not been there yet. <coughs> And uh, I would say to all of you that I wish you good luck in the election. And I can say for Muncie that I have been in every day of the last nine sessions of the Indiana legislature. I've been there all that time, somewhere, in or out. 
And I cannot remember of you people in this county sending to us a legislator that was not considered a high-class, intelligent friend of public <coughs> schools. I feel sure you're going to continue that record. To those of you who are candidates that haven't been there before, <coughs> Those that have been, of course, you understand the ropes. <clears throat> Those that haven't, you'll, get, you'll catch up uh, in the uh, whirly gig in a little while. I heard a veteran legislator one time describe the last week of the legislature. He said it reminded him of two men who had visited the tavern too late <clears throat> and uh, went to a hotel where they had a twin bedded room. And uh, the, <clears throat> they sort of uh, stumbled around there in the room a little while, uh, finishing up what they had <clears throat> to do. And uh, <clears throat> they turned out the light and both got into the same bed. <clears throat> well, they lay there for a few minutes and their <clears throat> minds were not uh, working as rapidly as normal. And the one fellow finally said to the other one, uh, say, I thought uh, we were supposed to have this room all to ourselves. <laughs> and the other fellow said, well, I did too. But there's some fella in bed with me. <laughs> well, <clears throat> first fellow said, well, there's some fella in bed with me too. And he says, I think we ought to kick him out of here. <laughs> well, so let's just count to three and kick him out. <laughs> So he counted the three and they gave a big kick. The little fellow landed on the floor. And the big fellow says, well, I got rid of the fellow that was in bed with me. And the little fellow says, well, I didn't. He says, the fellow that was in bed with me kicked me out. The big fellow yawned and he says, oh, well, just get in bed with me. <laughs> I couldn't do it any better. <laughs> Telling you how happy I am to be here with all these various people, I am not going to omit saying that I am happy to be here with the faculty of the Muncie Public School. I am complimented to be here with you because the faculty of the Muncie Public Schools is a top-notch faculty, one of the top-notch faculties in the United States. I wouldn't say these things that I'm going to say uh, if I were just alone with the legislators and your other laymen here. I wouldn't say it to them, <coughs> but uh, since you're here, they'll just have to listen, I think. And this is what I would like to say about you. <coughs> the funds of the state of Indiana are distributed to local schools on the basis of the training and the experience of teachers. Your experience here in Muncie is about normal, about average, statewide, which makes a difference, whatever difference there may be between the state average and you, fall in the category of training. As a result of the superb training, the superb qualifications of the faculty and the city schools in Muncie, there comes from state funds to the city of Muncie. Your funds are computed on the basis of $3,338 per teaching unit as compared with an average for the state of $3,100. That means that for each teaching unit in Muncie, the superb qualifications and training of the teachers of Muncie bring to this city, the City School Corporation Treasury, a total of $238 uh, per teaching unit. <clears throat> I don't very often look at my notes, but I guess I'll look that time and tell you that it is $3,438. In other words, there comes to the city of Muncie $338 per teaching unit <clears throat> because of the training and qualifications of the teachers of Muncie. You have 375 of those classroom units in Muncie. <clears throat> which means that last year a total of $127,000 more came to the city of Muncie 
than went to the average community in Indiana because of that factor of the training of the teachers of Muncie. When that is interpreted in terms of your tax rate, that means 18 cents on the local property tax rate in the city of Muncie, which comes to Muncie as a result, may I repeat, of the superb training and qualifications of the teachers of Muncie. This, this problem of, of training or the education of a teacher is, uh, is one of the problems that it seems to me is going to confront us as we move along here in the months immediately ahead of us. We have a terrific problem in the field of teacher supply, as you all know. I need not tell you that. You know what happened in the 1940s, the birth rate, <coughs> you know the enormous upsurge of pupils that are coming to us. Here in this one little cycle of a child's education, a 12 year period, from 1947 to 1959, in that one cycle of 12 years, the schools of Indiana will increase in size by a number of pupils equal to 20 school systems the size of the Fort Wayne public school system. In the last six years, we have added pupils equivalent to nine additional public school systems the size of the Fort Wayne school system. And in the next five years, we will add a, another 11 public school systems the size of the city of Fort Wayne's public school system. That, I believe, is just about the biggest development in education in the history of the world. Nothing has ever struck a public school system like that. As a result of that fact, there is pressure on this question of the qualifications of teachers. And I have had a strong conviction for many years that one of the basic fundamental problems in the supply of teachers, supply of adequate teachers, is this factor that might be expressed thus. Is the career of teaching going to amount to something sometime? And I believe we're on the way. I believe we've made great strides. We've had six or seven laws in the 1940s and the early 50s, all of which have emphasized the importance of well-prepared teachers. As a result, I believe that the young people in Indiana, the young men and young women in Indiana's high school, I believe that those people are changing their attitude about the profession of teaching. I know they're changing their attitude. I noticed the, the enrollment in the 1945-46 year in our two teachers' colleges was between 3,500 and 3,600 enrollees. This year, Dr. Emmons tells me that he believes that the enrollment in Ball State alone will almost approximate that figure that we had in both of them only nine years ago. I believe that the answer is not that uh, teachers are getting rich, but that there is a faith on the part of these young people that the quality of the people in the profession is rising and that the profession itself has hope for a future. And I think it would be one of the greatest tragedies that could strike the public school or the teaching profession if this 10 or 12 year campaign of progress in the direction of making teaching a true profession, one that all of its members will be happy and proud to be members of. If there is any halting or retrogression in that important movement, that it will be a calamity to the public school. I noticed the other day that the United States Chamber of Commerce had made a very significant contribution to consideration of this question. 
in the publication of a book several months ago, which I'm sure some of you may have seen. Mr. Schaefer tells me that he has a copy of it, and it is a remarkable compilation of facts which are played with great effect upon this title, Education and Investment in People, <coughs> in which the whole theme of the book, uh, which the United States Chamber has published, the whole objective is the of the book is to show, and it does show conclusively, that education is a good investment from the standpoint of the investor, the taxpayer, and the public. Incidentally, this excellent book shows that in many categories, in many respects, that the 48 states of our country arrange themselves in almost exact uh, position in education, in magazine subscriptions, in retail sales, in newspaper purchases, and even in political activity, which to me was something of a surprise. That education itself is the, is the constant around which these important economic and social activities are actually arranging themselves which is, in my opinion, a most conclusive proof <coughs> that education is an investment in people. I was interested in, in the comments here in this book as to the influence of education upon the income of people. And the book uh, <coughs> shows that the people in the United States who are earning the larger incomes are, for the most part, persons with a more advanced education. Of those in the $10,000 a year class and above, the average of education is one and a half years of college. Of those in the 4,000 class, and I shall not read other categories, and those in the 4,000 to 5,000 class, where I hope the teachers of Monday are, as a median, and I believe they are, in that class, the average of education throughout the country is 10 and one half years of education. <coughs> now, I hope you won't uh, conclude that I am meeting myself coming back <coughs> about the training and the qualifications of the teachers of Monday because uh, I suppose we would have to confess that in that one aspect, there is a slight hitch in the fine uh, compilation that uh, the Chamber of Commerce has made. That whereas throughout the country there is a very close correlation between education and income, uh, here in our group, uh, we find the rather anomalous situation that in Muncie, with a, a core of 430 teachers, of which 230 have five or more years of, ex of, of training, of college education, we find that the average of the country for that salary bracket is 10 and a half years of total education. I uh, <coughs> remember what Roger said about uh, two o'clock, and I don't want to belabor the question of training or of salaries. Sometimes the fellow gets to talk about something like that that affects himself or his own group. He falls into the class of the boy who went to a library to get a book, and the librarian talked him into taking a book on penguins. You may have heard this story, but I haven't heard it for quite a while. <laughs> ahead and tell it anyway. Uh, he brought the book back in several days and she said, how did you like that book on penguins? And the fellow said, the little boy said, well, uh, it was all right. And then she pressed him a little and said, well, really, what was wrong with the book? Well, he said, the only thing wrong with it was it just told me more about penguins than I wanted to know. 
<laughs> well, we do have a great many problems in education. And I think it might be a great mistake here as you are sitting in your luncheon at the opening of your new year of school, if you should allow yourselves to be, to, to absorb more about some of these problems than you want to know. <clears throat> but uh, I cannot think of any of our years, of course all years look serious as we start in on them. But this one, of course, being a legislative year, has certain unduly serious aspects about it. As we look forward to January, and uh, in our research department, as we have tried to figure out what the situation is uh, financially and with respect to teacher supply and other problems, I sometimes get to the place where I feel that uh, the problems look impossible. Take this school building problem, for instance. We need $120 million for the building. We have $6 billion of assessed valuation. If we bonded every bit of it up to the hill, 2% of the constitutional bonding limit, that's what we get. 2% of $6 billion would give you $120 million. We need $120 million for the school building. If we didn't owe anybody a cent, and bonded ourselves, built them, we will be bonded to the limit. But two-thirds of the $6 billion assessed valuation are already bonded. And the other third is located around in various places where there aren't so many children, and they don't want to bond it. <coughs> now, a problem like that really looks tough, doesn't it? The same thing is true of the teacher supply. Last year, we graduated 2,260 teachers from our colleges. 2,260 teachers from our teachers' colleges in Indiana. Between June and September, just three months, we lost 753 of them. 105 of them went back to school for one reason or another, some to continue their education for teachers and some to become something else. That means that about 650 of those 2260 absolutely disappeared from the educational scene, either as students or as teachers. And then we started the year last fall after that happened. September to June, nine months, we lost them at over 100 a month. Over 100 a month. Young people, I'm not talking about people old enough to get anything out of the retirement fund, people old enough to get any retirement benefits, young people who came to us on the retirement board, of which I'm a member, who came, who sent their applications and said, give me my what payments I made back. And there was scarcely any of those young people, 977 of them in nine months' time. There was scarcely any of them had as much as $1,000 in the fund. The payments are about 180 a year. So you can see how old those people were. They were young people, and they were leaving it. So we lost about 650 of them before we even got through the summer. And we lost almost 1,000 of them during the year, all young people. 1,600 or 1,700 of those people that we had and lost. Now there isn't any profession whether it be medicine or law or dentistry or engineering, no profession can stand any such drain as that and stand up and serve in the capacity that it is supposed to serve its public. That kind of a drain doesn't exist anywhere else. And it is a serious drain that must be reversed in some manner or other. How it's going to be done likewise is a difficult problem. And like the building problem looks serious. We do know, of course, that there's a, a considerable uh, surplus down there in the Treasury. <clears throat> but it would not take long to use that surplus up. And one of these days, it won't take long to use it up. 
we have all kinds of proposals to use it to build a new state house and one member has actually suggested building three new state houses in three cities of the state so it wouldn't take long for that to, to leave us sometimes when I get to this point and I think of these problems and how tough they seem even the problems themselves to say nothing about the attitudes of some who do not seem to want to solve the problem I get the feeling like the case of the fellow that I told you about one time who lived on one side of a graveyard and worked on the other and as he was going home one night he fell into a grave that had been dug it was very dark he tried to jump out and he couldn't he yelled and screamed and whistled finally he thought well I'll just sit here till morning Pretty soon, a little after midnight, a fellow came along who had visited the tavern a while, and he stumbled into the grave too. He jumped up and tried to get out, and he screamed and yelled and whistled. The first fellow was rather amused, sitting down there in the corner of the grave, and he got up in the darkness, he reached over and tapped the fellow on the shoulder, he said, there's no use yelling, you can't get out of here, but he did. <laughs> feel about some of these problems they look kind of hopeless they are frustrating they look like there's no solution to them but there's one glorious thing about this country and this state and this city that there are a lot of people in all three of those places who don't know that certain things are impossible and that's the kind of a thing I believe that has made this country and this state and this city what they are. We need a lot of people who don't know that certain problems can't be solved, who don't know that certain things are impossible. That's the spirit I believe that has existed in those three places and I believe it exists in the organized teaching profession. And with that a conviction about you and about our public I feel sure that we shall solve the problem we shall keep on with our march of progress thank you very much for inviting me <coughs>